Looking at data visually has always been so useful to us humans. I mean, numbers are great, don't get me wrong, but I've always understood more when it's laid out in front of me in some kind of visual format. We've talked about benchmarking before, about how we can use timers to see how long certain blocks of code take. If you missed that video, you can find it in the top right corner. But today we're gonna to be looking at something much better. We're gonna take that data and look at it visually. Hey, what's up guys? My name is Jonah. Welcome back to my C++ series. Yeah, 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 okay, you guys get the point. So this video is gonna be a little bit different than the usual ones. I just thought that I would mix it up a little bit. Let me know what you think of this kind of format. What we're gonna be talking about today is gonna to be really simple. Any one of you could just take this and slap it into your own code and actually use it in a matter of minutes. And the benefit that you're gonna get is huge. I mean, I'm like doing this kind of stuff in any kind of project that I'm working on that's kind of long term that I'm gonna keep coming back to and where I care about the performance, you know, I've got a system like this running because being able to see stuff visually obviously is just so, so, so important. But before we get into that, I just wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills with unlimited access to all of these classes if you sign up for a premium membership, which is less than $10 per month. It's really one of the best places on the internet that you can go to to learn just such a wide variety of stuff. They just have so many classes on there. Anything from illustration, graphic design, how to make better videos, how to make better websites, animation, how to shoot better photos, classes on music production, and even interior design. I mean, who wouldn't benefit by just making their space better? If you haven't checked out Skillshare yet, I encourage you guys to do so. There's really no reason not to because there is a link in the description to a two month free trial. That should give you more than enough time to check it out, see if you like it and learn something new. And of course that link to two months of free Skillshare premium membership is in the description below. Let's talk about profiling. Okay, so here we have a blank uh, C++ project. This is just like a little sandbox that I like to play with. You guys know me, I like to start off with a completely blank project. That way you get to see everything from scratch. So the first thing I wanna do is actually write some functions for us to profile. There's nothing here to actually record the performance of. We wanna come up with something for us to actually test out. So I'm just gonna write two functions. They're not gonna be anything particularly exciting. They're just gonna print stuff off into the console. I'll stick a square root in one of them just for fun, but there's, this can be absolutely anything. If you have your own program, of course, you're gonna already have all of these functions. This is just something that I'm creating, just some dummy data for us to actually deal with. So with these functions ready to go, the next step is to see how long they take to execute. I did a video recently about benchmarking in C++. I'll have it linked in the top right corner. Make sure that you check it out. We're basically gonna steal the timer class from there and use it here. And as you can see, what I've done is I'm just printing the name of the timer along with how long it took in milliseconds so that we know how long our timer took. Using our timer is pretty straightforward. It's a scope based timer, which basically just means that we need to construct an object for it to start timing. And then upon destruction, or in other words, when the scope ends, it will automatically stop and print our results to the console. Let's go ahead and run this program and see what we get. Okay, so here we have the result of function two, took 987 milliseconds, and then we annoyingly have to scroll all the way back here to find function one, which actually took more time at 1012 milliseconds. Cool, so we can get results out of this timer. It's pretty nice, but obviously they are still just numbers. And not only that, but they are just really hard to find and it's just super annoying to go through your console looking for these numbers and then trying to make sense of how everything worked out. Enter visualization. We'll actually enter Google Chrome. How many of you guessed that we would be using Google Chrome to visualize our profiles? So Chrome actually comes with some profiling tools of its own amongst other development tools, obviously for things like web apps or web pages. And there's this particular one called Chrome Tracing and it's really bare bones, really, really simple. It lets us visualize our profile in kind of a stack trace view like this. You just type in chrome colon forward slash forward slash tracing into your URL bar. And then there you have it, chrome tracing. And because it's just part of Chrome, it's most likely already installed on your computer and ready to go. So as you can see, it looks pretty bare bones. And that's one of the things that I love about it. The way that it works is it simply loads in a JSON file, which has all of the data in it. So our next step is to take all of that timing data that we're recording with our timer and put it into a JSON file in the format that Chrome Tracing expects. And that's what we're gonna do now. 
So back here in our code, just above our timer class, I've got this other class called Instrumenter. And this is this is quite a simple class. Really all it's doing is just formatting a JSON file and writing it out into a file. So we begin with this begin session uh, function. Really all that's doing is opening a file and then writing a header, which is just essentially the beginning of the JSON file that needs to be in a particular format for Chrome tracing. And then the end session does a similar thing, but it just writes out a simple footer, closes the file, does all that kind of stuff. And we also have this concept of sessions, which is really simple. Now, write profile is the meat of this entire class. This is what writes an individually timed profile. So every time we run our timer, this is what we want to output. And you'll notice that at the end of this, once it's output all, the, all this JSON into the output stream, it actually flushes it. The reason we want to do this every time we write a profile is because just in case our program crashes or we terminate it or whatever, we don't want to lose all of our profiling data. We want to kind of stream this into the file as we go along so that if anything like happens and we, we can't end smoothly, everything, all of our data is just safe and ready for us to actually use. So I'm gonna go ahead and rename this into instrumentation timer, just so that it's a little bit more clear about what it's used for, because we're gonna add some code here in a minute that actually makes it like specifically use the instrumenter. And by the way, this concept of instrumentation is, is going through our code and adding like these profiling timers. That's why all of this is to do with instrumentation. So again, the right profile function is exactly what we're looking for. So I'm gonna grab that. It uses profile result as a struct that, that just contains some data such as the name, the start and the end. So I'm just gonna call that function here with the name, the start and the end time point. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is scroll down to our main function and what we need to do is begin and end our sessions. So what begin session actually does is it creates a new file with a given file name. We're just relying on the default parameter here, which is results.json. And then everything in between the begin session and end session gets put into that specific profiling file. And this enables us to split up our profiling data into multiple files, which as you can imagine, can be quite useful. For example, in a game, we might wanna profile specifically the kind of loading screen or the start startup section of our code, but then when we're actually rendering and we're running kind of frame to frame and we've actually got the gameplay, that's like a completely different ball game altogether. Maybe we want to profile that separately. And by having this concept of sessions, we can we can do that as, as much as we want. All right, so after just cleaning up our code and fixing some errors a little bit, we have our running program. You can see it doesn't output anything into the console anymore because it should all be going into our results.json file. So let's take a look at that. If we open the containing folder, go to our root directory here, we have results.json file. Let's just drop that into Visual Studio to take a look at the text contents of this file. So we have function one, for example, which is that name of the time. We have the duration, and then we also have the actual uh, starting time point. TS, I'm assuming, stands for timestamp. And then we just have like an array of this, and that is essentially all of the data that we need to give Chrome Tracing. So now that we have this JSON file, let's go ahead and drop it into Chrome Tracing and see what we get. Okay, so check this out. We have our profiling data visualized now. We have function one, function two, but you can see that something's a little bit wrong in the timeline here. It says 1000 microseconds, and that's what the wall duration is down here as well one millisecond. Obviously this did not take one millisecond, it took a thousand milliseconds. So we're off by a factor of a thousand. Let's go back and see if we can fix that. Should be pretty simple. If we just change our time point cast to cast into microseconds instead of milliseconds, then we should have our timing start and end data in the right format for Chrome tracing. Let's rerun our program here to get some new data, drop it back into Chrome tracing. And now you can see we're at a thousand milliseconds, we've got the right kind of scale. So this is really cool because obviously we can see all this stuff visually. We have function one first, then we run function two. We can see how long it takes. And of course, as we saw earlier, we can actually look at this in kind of like a stack trace format. So let's go ahead and add another function. I'll call it run benchmarks. This will just call function one and function two, but now since we have like another function up in the stack, we should be able to visualize this as well. I'll just print something out to the console, like running benchmarks, and then we'll stick that instrumentation timer into this function as well. We'll have to give it a name, of course, which is getting a little bit annoying, but we'll address that in a minute. Let's go ahead and run our code and see what we get. You can see it's printing running benchmarks here at the top. And if we get this new results.json file, pop it into Chrome tracing, there you have it. We have run benchmarks, which calls function one, followed by function two. We can see all this visually and we can see the entire time of both of the benchmarks by looking at wall duration of run benchmarks. So this is, we're actually getting somewhere now. I like this, this is getting visual, it's really nice. But unfortunately this run benchmarks, having to just 
just copy and paste the, the name the name of each function that we call is getting a little bit annoying. What can we do to fix this up? Additionally, this kind of timing code is not something that we want to run all the time in our program. There should be an easy way to shut all of this off because of course it does add some considerable overhead. So we're going to solve both of these problems by writing some macros. I'm going to define a macro here called profile scope, which is going to take in name as a parameter. This is basically just going to wrap our instrumentation timer call. We'll just concatenate the line number here just so that we can have a unique name for our variable in case we have a bunch of these in a row. Probably don't need the double hash here depending on which compiler you use. I'm just going to use it to be safe. We're just concatenating timer along with the line number here. Now we can replace our instrumentation timer calls with this profile scope macro. And then finally, I'm just going to add a define here called profiling, which will set to one. If this is set to one, then profiling is enabled, which means we will actually have profile scope run our instrumentation timer and do all of that stuff. However, if it's disabled, you can see that we can just have it just be empty, which means that it will replace profile scope with just no code at all, which effectively just strips out that timer from any kind of build, which has profiling set to zero. So this is great, but obviously doesn't fix our problem of what if I just introduce a new function like this run app function, and then I want to profile the scope. Oh no, I have to go back here and change my string to run app. That just makes it a little bit more cumbersome and annoying. Can we do something about this? Yes, of course we can. I'm going to write a new macro called profile function. No parameters for this one. This is just going to call profile scope, but for the name, it's going to take in the name of the function, which we can do using this compiler macro called function. Don't forget to include this into the else statement of your macro like I did. And then you can replace profile scope with profile function all throughout your code. And this is just going to be completely magical. We can just run this and it will actually take the name of the function and set that as the name of the profile. So if we drop this back into Chrome tracing, you can see that we have the same result as before. We have run, run benchmarks, function one, function two, but this was not a string that we actually put in ourselves. This was done by the preprocessor, which is really cool. However, we kind of run into a problem here. What if we have parameters? And by that, I mean specifically overloaded functions. What if both of these functions are called print function? They have the same function name, but they have different signatures. So in other words, we've added an int value here, which just adds its value to i. And then I have print function with that parameter being called, which is one function, and then the other function without a parameter being called. If I run this now and take a look at it, they're both gonna be called print function because all that preprocessor function define is doing is taking the actual name of the function, which is print function, and that's it. But we actually want more information. We want the signature. Can we do that? There's another one called func sig, which is a function signature. If we plug that in to our profile scope macro and take a look at this, then of course we'll get the entire function signature, which is great. Now there is this calling convention that's part of the signature, which we don't really care about. But of course, if you really wanted to just via some string processing, you could easily just strip that out before you put it into your JSON file. Okay, awesome. This is looking pretty good. Now you can take this profile function macro and just put it into like literally every single function of your program if you wanna see what this looks like. And if we were to like add a namespace such as like benchmark or something into here, since we're using that func sig macro, of course, we'll get all of that information as well, which is really cool. And in case there are areas in your code that you wanna profile that are not, functions specifically, you can stick that profile scope into any scope whatsoever. You can make an empty scope if you need to and you'll see everything here. So here we have that benchmark namespace showing up. Awesome. So the other cool thing that Chrome Tracing supports is multiple threads. You can actually set a thread ID over here. We're just setting it to zero in this example. And then if you do that, you can actually visualize all of your threads running concurrently, which first of all is useful outside of profiling to just see what on earth is going on in your program. That's one of the things that I love about this. But then of course it makes timing in general and profiling a lot more powerful. So let's go ahead and stick a thread ID into our structure here. And then we'll also output that thread ID into our JSON file, of course. Now we need to go to our stop function in our timer and see what thread the timer was actually run on so that we can set up this thread ID. And of course, the C++ standard library makes this very difficult to actually retrieve the thread ID as an actual integer. But since thread ID implements a hash function, we can just use this little trick. We'll pass our thread ID into that struct, of course, into write profile. And then let's just go down here and change our benchmarks a little bit so that they actually use multiple threads so that we can see this thread stuff in action. 
I initially tried to use SCD bind here, but that ended up being way more trouble than it's worth because of course it's an overload of an identically named function. And so you have to cast it into, anyway, it just becomes a huge mess. It's a lot easier to, to just use lambdas. So I used that. I also added in these two joins at the end of this function, just so that we don't actually exit this run benchmarks function until both of these threads have completed their work. All right, let's run our new multi-threaded benchmark, which in general is not a good multi-threading test because of all the flushing that is being that is happening from the CR function. But that's not the point, of course. Our point is actually to see the Chrome tracing results. And if we drop that in, you can see we have three distinct threads, the run benchmark one, and then the two other threads that it kicks off. I'm just gonna go back into the code and get rid of that B thread. We don't really need it just so that we can see the call stack from that initial run benchmarks thread, which is just our main thread. If we rerun this program and then drop in that file, there you have it. So we have run benchmarks, which actually calls the print function with no parameter by itself. And then the integer one is spun off on a different thread. And you can see how we can visualize that in Chrome tracing, which is super cool. Finally, I just wanted to show you guys more of a real world example of how you can use this. So here I have a branch of the Hazel engine that I wanted to profile. I've split it up into three sessions, startup, runtime, and shutdown. Let's start by taking a look at the startup. So this is pretty cool because you can see how long it takes your application to basically start up. And here most of the time is spent in loading a mesh. So you can see that the import is reading the file and we have a few other things going on here that you could of course drill down and take more of a look at if, for example, it was just taking a little bit too long to load and you weren't sure. So this is really cool because you get to see everything visually, obviously. So runtime is probably the most interesting one. This is actually the application as it renders frame to frame. So if you drill down, you can actually see exactly how long a frame took. So in this case, about one and a half milliseconds. That is the duration of an entire frame. You can see how it gets broken down here into all the different parts. For example, it's really easy to see how long the layer update took compared to everything else. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I think that this stuff is super useful. I'll have a link in the description below to some kind of like gist or something like that that'll contain the code that I used in this video for you guys to try it out yourselves. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that like button. I wanna see you guys actually use this. Put it into your code, give it a shot right now and just visualize everything that you're doing. It's amazing because not only is it gonna help you benchmark your code and see what parts are slow, what parts are fast, but if you're building something quite big, this will let you kind of visually look at the code as it runs. Because as I mentioned, like it's not just the timing, it's not just like the actual data of, okay, this took 60 milliseconds, this took three milliseconds, this took blah, blah, blah. It's not just that that's interesting. It's the actual structure of your entire code, especially if you've got numerous threads, being able to see something like that is, is so, so, so useful. So let me know what you thought of this in the comment section below. Hopefully it was useful to you guys. Don't forget to check out the free two months of Skillshare Premium link in the description below and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.